Welcome back to part 3 of the Mortal Kombat series, where we're exploring how to use Boris FX and other software to create this look. In the previous section, we took a look at how to unwrap a model in Ryzen UV. So in this section, we're going to take a look at how I textured the model in Substance Painter, and also how I use lights in Redshift Cinema 4D to create good lighting. So let's get started. So with the UVs finished, the next step was to bring the Mortal Kombat Dragon into Substance Painter for texturing. And I've already completed it, but I want to walk you through some of the main steps that I took. Now the first thing, if you're new to Substance Painter, is to come up to the File menu and choose New. And select your FBX file. Ryzen UV saves in .fbx format, so I'll just click Open. And just making sure that Use UV Tile Workflow is turned on because I'm using UDIMS. And click OK. There's always a good feeling when you've finished a model and you bring it into Substance Painter for texturing. So over on the left, I've got my 3D view. On the right, I've got my 2D view. And I can show one or the other here. I should go to 2D. So there's my UDIMS 1001 to 1003. Remembering that. On the right, we have the ring, and in these two, we have the dragon. And just by way of review, remember that I decided on the maximum texel density for the dragon, and then I applied the texel density to the ring as well. And when I did that, it meant that with the seams that I had at the time, the ring wasn't going to fit onto the UV tile, so I had to actually make some cuts and add some quite obvious seams. Now, I already knew that I'd be able to handle that no problem in Substance Painter by using triplanar mapping. And I just want to walk you through a couple of different approaches that I could have taken. I've actually, if I come up to the texture set list, I've actually got one material here. And when I import into Substance Painter, the materials that I have are converted to texture sets. And you can see. My one material or one texture set has three UV tiles. And that means when I apply a material to this, I can either choose triplanar mapping or UV projection. If I use UV projection, then the seams on the ring are going to be obvious, but I'm going to get a great result on the dragon. If I use triplanar mapping on the object, the seams on the ring won't be evident, but I'm not going to get quite as good fidelity in my materials as if I'd use UV projection. Because triplanar mapping actually blends the edges of different textures to hide the seams. And that's a really basic way of describing what it does. But I've felt in my experience that I get a better result using UV projection. So wherever possible, I prefer to use UV projection. And I always like to unwrap my objects in a way where I can hide the seams and then I don't have to use triplanar. It is really handy to have that, especially in situations like this. So I'm in a bit of a conundrum. Do I use UV projection or do I use triplanar? But the simple answer is I can use both. I actually ended up, because I have one material, using masking to use both triplanar and UV projection. But you could have also used two separate materials. Could have had one material for the ring and one material for the dragon. but I prefer to, especially when I'm using UDIMS, just use a single material. But there's definitely more than one way to do this kind of thing in Substance Painter. Okay, so it's going to bring back my 3D view. And the next step, once you've imported your model, is to bake the various maps. Just by coming over to the Texture Set Settings tab and coming down to Bake Mesh Maps. I like to bake mine at 4096. Now, I don't have any normals in this, so I don't need to bake that. I don't have an ID pass, and I'm not using subsurface scattering, so I don't need thickness. I'm not using high, low poly workflow either for this, but I will actually just increase the subsampling. And then I've only got one texture set, so whether I click Bake Dragon or Bake Selected Textures, doesn't matter. So I'll just click on Bake Dragon, and that'll go through and bake those mesh maps. And I'll just pause for a moment while that's just doing its job. Okay, so that's now baked all of those mesh maps. 
and that's ready to start texturing. So I'll quickly just walk you through the approach that I took for this. Let me just close this one up. Now when I approach texturing in Substance Painter, I generally don't start from scratch. I tend to make use of the huge library of materials that are already in Substance Painter and all of those ones that are on Substance Source. So for something like this, I would probably come over to my shelf and just type in maybe metal or more specifically bronze because I figured this would be made of bronze. Let's just make that specifically bronze. And what I'll do is I will just literally just drag materials across to my layers and just audition them. See how close they might get to the kind of look that I want. So just spend a bit of time sort of window shopping them, dropping them on, seeing whether they're anywhere close. That one's probably not quite right. And something like bronze armor would make sense. So that looks quite good, kind of getting me somewhere there. I want to get as much or get as close as I can just using out of the box textures rather than you know having to build things up layer by layer. Something like bronze corroded because I probably want a bit of corrosion in this as well. It's probably a little too much corrosion. So definitely keep that in there. Uh, bronze statue is a different kind of corrosion. Probably got some edge wear in there as well. That's interesting as well. Let's turn that off. Uh, cast bronze, which isn't bad as well. Maybe I'll take a look at some of the steel. And a lot of these textures I've actually imported from Substance Source. Something like, let's see, what, what's this medieval stylized? It is just fun to drop various materials on there and see how they look. That's quite interesting. And nothing painted, of course. Steel ruined could be quite good. Because I imagine this has got a fair bit of wear and tear. So that's pretty good as well. So I ended up with a list of about 20 different materials and smart materials. And some of them, like this one here, uh, which was the first one I grabbed, Antique Bronze Darkened, that looked pretty good to me. That seemed like a pretty good start. So the next thing to do is come down and some of them have presets. You can check those out. Or come down to the various settings that a lot of these materials have. So just playing around with the different settings inside of this base material, seeing how close I can get. Now roughness, do I want it, do I want it rougher? So that was a you know pretty good base. And if I drop that one on top, and that's going to completely cover that, which is not what I want. I can use various blend modes, but what I'll do is I'll grab the bits that I like. So for this one, you know, maybe that sort of dirty edge damage and dirt was quite good. So I'll just turn off the base, turn off this, uh, turn off the bumps. Maybe the edge damage is too much. And then just grab what I like. You just grab the dirt and take it out like that. And then just delete what I don't want. So that's the good thing about smart materials like this, these ones that are in folders. They're obviously built from a whole lot of different layers. You just grab the bits that you need and delete what you don't need like that. So that's how I approach the dragon. So what I'm going to do is open up the finished version and we'll walk through that a little bit more. And just before I do that, you can see here, there's that horrible seam. Okay. So keep that in mind when I open up this other version. I'll just pause for a moment. So here's the finished dragon. Let's talk about this one. Now you can see that I actually have two separate folders here, one for ring and one for dragon. And notice how we're no longer seeing those seams along the ring. That's because what I did was I set up the material in UV mode, UV projection mode, and then I grouped that and duplicated it. And then I just changed my projection to triplanar. So the ring uses triplanar projection and the dragon uses UV projection. As I said, I prefer to use UV projection wherever I can. Let's take a quick look at 
the layers. I'm not going to go through all of them, but here you can see there's my antique bronze darkened. I'll just turn off a whole bunch of these, just turn them all off actually. And we'll just do a quick walkthrough. There we go. So, antique bronze darkened, but you can see below that I have cast bronze sculpture. Let me just turn that on. And it's barely visible, but you can see there's a little bit of bump in that that I quite liked. So, I've just left the height channel on, turned off all the other ones. There's a whole lot of settings in that particular material, but I haven't used any of them other than the height. I just like the height. Because height is uh, combined. Layers on top add their height value to the layers below and the normal values. That's very subtle. It just adds a little bit of bump in there. And just kept layering them one on top of the other. Or from various uh, materials that I grabbed out of the shelf and off substance source. Now for the eye, obviously the eye uses an emissive material. And let me just come back to my 3D, 2D. You can see if I alt click on the mask here, you can see I've actually masked out the eye. And that was just done in polygon fill mode, just by coming in here or coming in here. And I've just used the polygon fill option here and just dragged like that to add to that selection. So that masks out the emissive material. Now in order to get the emissive material to even be visible, I had to add an emissive channel. And that is up here in channels. If I click plus, here I can choose emissive. And I've already added it, so you can see it's down here. And for that particular layer, I've chosen Emissive here. So there's the eye, and above that added some eye occlusion, just to sort of you know, mask that out a little bit, add a bit of grime and dirt in the corners. Let me just hide this, uh, where is it? hide the 2D. Above that, I have this neck pattern. So this neck pattern was just a file I created in Illustrator. And I just saved that out as a PNG file. You can see I've added a black mask like that. And then I've added a fill. Add a fill effect. And to the fill effect, I've just used my grayscale dragon decal. So it's a black and white file that I um, created in Illustrator and saved out as a PNG. And then I've just positioned that. We just go to my other views. 3D and 2D. You can see here with my show hide manipulator selected, I've just positioned that in place. I think I actually, now come to think of it, for this one, yeah, I use color as well because I wanted to add a little bit of color to that. So black and white height map for that. And then just once again, using different parts of different materials and adding on top. Let's keep turning those on. Some there's some occlusion around the eyes, some edge wear, some edge highlights, until I got the look that I was after. This one here is the oxidation. So adding a bit of oxidation, and you can see it's only around the eyes and just certain areas. And that's using a dirt generator. So with a black mask, just adding a generator and choosing the dirt generator. That way, with a generator like dirt, I can come and I can adjust the dirt level. See, I can, I can increase the oxidation. I want it to be quite oxidized. 
I can uh, adjust the amount of grunge, more or less grunge. I just want a little subtle bit of oxidation in there. And some dirt drips. And once I had that material set up, obviously I could spend hours and hours and hours just tweaking it. Um, but I was pretty happy with that look overall. I was holding down the shift key right mouse button to move my environment. Once I had that, then I duplicated it, then I grouped it, then I duplicated it, and I created the ring version. And it's exactly the same, no changes other than removing the eye, because there is no eye on the ring, and selecting each of the materials and making sure that projection was changed to triplanar from UV projection. And also anything under the masks, any of the generators, just making sure that they're also changed to triplanar projection. So anywhere I could change it to triplanar, I did. And all of those seams have gone. There's no seams on this whatsoever. So that's the way I can combine UV projection with triplanar projection on the same model. So once the materials were all set up, the next stage was to get this across to Redshift for Cinema 4D. And for that, I used the plugin from Zolotl Studios. This is Substance Painter Live Link, which automates everything. So once I have everything ready, I just choose my renderer, in my case, Redshift, and I choose the size that I want, 4096, and I just choose the texture set. I only have one. I actually also want to choose UDIMS because I'm using UDIMS. And just see if I can get some space here. So we can see the bottom. And click Dragon, and then I click Send. And once I click Send, that takes that across to Cinema 4D and sets up all of my materials. And so if I switch back across to Cinema 4D, you can see that after a few moments, my Dragon material now looks like it has a material applied. If I click on Edit Shader Graph, one of the huge benefits of using Zlotl's Live Link plugin is that it creates all of the materials. So it imports all of the different textures and links them up to all of their relevant channels, which saves me so much time because otherwise I'd have to do this manually. And notice also, I've got metallic just selected here. If I come over to the path, you can see that it's using the UDIM tag at the end here. So it's great that Redshift understands UDIMs because Cinema 4D doesn't currently. So the next thing is to do the lighting. Now I could quite easily just use a dome light and I have one set up in here. Let me just bring the render view over here. And Currently, you can just see the eye. Remember, that's that emissive channel that I added in Substance Painter and it's been converted in Redshift. Let's just turn this on. Okay, so now we're progressive rendering. So I've actually imported the same HDR that I was using in Substance Painter, the panorama. And I like to do that because if I'm lighting with a certain HDR, I want to bring that across the cinema and check the textures with the same HDR just to make sure that everything's looking correct. Let's turn that on. And that's looking just like it looks in Substance Painter. But the thing with HDRs is, I mean, they can do a reasonably good job, but it's more of a blanket approach to lighting rather than a precision approach. I can't really control it other than coming into you know, coordinates. Let's give myself some room here. And, you know, maybe rotating, rotating the environment. So I can't really do very much other than that. So I don't really use HDRs to light in Cinema 4D using Redshift. I like to use area lights. And sometime last year, I watched Tim Clapham's Great Training, which is available on the Hello Lux website. This is the pro lighting with Cinema 4D and Redshift. And I already knew a fair bit about lighting in Redshift, but I learned a lot from this. And even more importantly, I was able to get hold of, by watching the training, get hold of Tim's uh, rig. He's created a rig for area lights, and I use these with every single project now because it makes lighting so much easier. And you can see when I click on the top null, there's user data that's being set up 
with heading, pitch, and distance. So I don't have to go into my scene and move lights around. It's all controlled through this user data. So just middle mouse click here, and I'll just click on this top light. I'm going to turn off the dome light. If I just zoom out here, you can see there's my there's my top light just there. And if we look at the render, there's the result of the top light. So see if we can see both of these at the same time. So look at the top view here, and I'll just move this out of the way. And if I adjust the uh, pitch, I can move the light in front of the dragon or behind. In my case, I'm at the top. I can also adjust the heading and the rotation of the light and, of course, the distance. So with the area light, if I move it closer, it's going to get brighter. And if I move it further away, it'll be less bright. And that'll also affect the shadows. So what I do is I use one of these and I keep duplicating it until I've illuminated the dragon the way I want. So I didn't actually start with the top light. Generally, I'll start with a key light. So either lighting on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Once again, if we have a look in these views, you can see there it is there. I adjust the heading. You can see I can rotate that around the object. I can change the pitch, moving it up and down. And I can also adjust the distance. So I used a key light and to change the, the warmth of the light, just coming down and selecting the area light and then just changing the color. And obviously I wanted this to be fairly warm. I didn't necessarily start from the bottom and then just work my way up. I added plenty of different lights and tweaked them, moved them around until I got the look that I was after. And then I just renamed these as to you know where they were in the scene. So obviously we've got the top light, this one here, and we've got the key light. So the key light without the top looks like that. So the top light really is just hitting this area around here. And as per usual when I'm doing any kind of lighting, I've always learned to sort of sculpt with light. You don't want to put so much light in that everything gets flat. You don't want to have too few lights where you don't highlight the detail or the contours of your subject. Definitely is a learned art form and you know, I'm still trying to improve with it. Okay, so I'll just leave the backlights off and I'll just turn on some of these fills. So I've got a top right fill here, which just sort of fills in some of this area. You can see a big difference that that, that makes. It's already starting to look pretty good, getting some nice you know, shading down here, but it's a little dark down here and a little dark in these areas here. You can't even see the geometry in there. Obviously, depending on the background that it's on, um, these would be hidden or revealed. I've got a fill bottom front, so that'd be down here. That's going to light this area a little better. Let's turn that one on. So a little bit of illumination here. And with that, I probably, yeah, see, I put it at its maximum distance, so it's quite far away. I've got a back left light, um, which I think is somewhere over here at the back. And it doesn't do a lot. And if you want to see what an individual light does, of course, you need to turn the other ones off. So just select those and turn those off and choose back left. So that's just highlighting the top horn a little bit. And more importantly, just, just bringing a little bit of light onto these, these frills. I guess they're horns on the back frill or the back of the dragon. Let's turn all of them back on again. And I'll just turn back left off again. So it's only subtle, but it just helps them pop out a little bit. If I wanted to adjust that, just select it and adjust the heading just to get the light in exactly the right position. Adjust the distance. If I bring it closer, obviously it's going to be brighter. You can see how easy this light rig makes this. I don't mind it kind of like that actually because it just lightens up the bottom of the jaw a little bit. I'm going to undo that. 
bring it closer. It's also affecting the top here. Kind of makes that stand out a little bit more. That's quite nice. Just the heading. Don't want to bring it too far around to the front. That looks pretty good. And I've got a backlight for the overall ring and dragon. So I'll turn that on. And that's mostly affecting just the ring. I think that's just for the ring. Uh, for the, I think that's for both. Let's just check that out. Yeah, so that's, that's for both. And that's giving um, a slight blue cast to that because I've made that blue. I like to use a blue light behind. I think it gives a nice um, contrast to the, to the warm lights. And I've also got a backlight for the dragon because this one was enough just to add a little bit of brightness or a little bit of blue on the inside extrusion of the ring, which looks quite nice. But this optimal position for the ring gives me virtually no result on the dragon. So in this case, I duplicated it. And for the dragon only one, I've just dragged the, delete this is an old one, I've dragged the ring into the exclusion so it's not affecting the ring under the project tab. So if I turn this one on, you can see this is quite a bright one. And this is a nice rim light that really helps cut these out of the background. And if I adjust that, I can adjust the pitch. See, I can move it up and down. I want it to get as much of the mouth and you know the base of the jaw and the tongue, just to sort of separate that a little bit. These are areas that we're getting a little hidden. And I've got one more duplicate of the key light for the ring on the left and the right. So basically, I just duplicated the key and just adjusted the settings. It's going to give me sort of a bright spot on the left and the right, which matches the original um, icon that I based this on. So I got that one there and that one there. Let me just turn off the left one again. So just trying to be careful not to flatten things out too much. Bring it up to 100. And like I said, it takes a lot of practice, and I'm always trying to improve with every model that I light, try and get a little bit better at it. Often I'll do some lighting, and then I'll put it down for the day, and then I'll pick it up again the next day, and I might see something that I didn't see. But I think overall that looks pretty well illuminated without being too flat. And it also gives me a little bit of flexibility for when I take this into After Effects, it's not too blown out in, in any areas where I can actually do a bit of a, maybe an exposure effect or, um, or some gamma in Sapphire just to you know, do some further color correction. Next, what I'm going to do is add a simple animation to this. Then I'm going to render it out, take it into After Effects and add some effects. So thanks for watching. Once again, this is John Dickinson for Boris FX. To learn more about the various Boris FX products or to watch more of these kinds of tutorials, be sure to visit borisfx.com.